Uh, good morning, everyone. So over the next few minutes, what I'll be trying to uh, tell you is something um, of what we've been doing and what we will we'll be trying to do. So over the last several years, we've been working on psychiatric genetics for a long time. A long time in psychiatric genetics is about 10 years. So about... Um, uh, so uh, this is... Uh, we, uh, we realized very early on that uh, uh, because of the collection that NIM has and because of our clinical work, uh, lots of people tended to bring relatives to us for illnesses and therefore we had a very ready access to fairly large pedigrees. This particular pedigree turned out to have a uh, nonsense mutation in the synaptogyrin gene which, which was in a particular region of the gene which affected the isoform that was expressed in the brain which was expressed mainly in the amygdala and the hippocampus which are regions of interest for schizophrenia. Three people who were ill had carried this top uh, codon mutation as did one unaffected person. All these three lived uh, fairly long lives. They all died in the 60s and 70s and all three are now dead but they all have um, children and presumably some of them do carry the stop codon but none of them have developed schizophrenia to the best of our knowledge. So although we get these rare variants which seem to co-segregate with disease the story is not very clear and it's right down to the end. When you start looking at things like polygenic disorders like dementia and, and other things then you find out that, uh, that in pedigrees it, it tends to run in, in families. Oops. It tends to run in families. We can see that it has a, that is, they are fairly severely ill. We know that APOE4 is, uh, is implicated, is alpha of um, a clear, clearance of these candidate genes is affected. We know that, that the brain size differs at various points depending on the presence or absence of APOE4 and that APOE4 itself is very highly correlated with dementia in India, although the population rates of APOE4 allele are much lower than in Western Europe. This is also uh, has an impact on actual gray, gray matter and white matter distribution, but this is relatively modest and the gene effects seem to be larger than the disease effects. And that is even more evident when you find that the 5-HT2A receptor polymorphism which Panik just talked about, we looked at its effects on brain structure and the ones who were carrying the so-called uh, deviant allele showed greater brain volumes in the left, inter left inferior temporal and the left inferior occipital regions and if the person carried three risk alleles, so-called putative risk alleles for schizophrenia, then the changes in brain volume were even uh, higher and these were the COMT alleles, the, the, uh, the serotonin transport and the 5 h 2 a 2 polymorphism, the serotonin receptor genes. So these are the genes which have been uh, commonly implicated both for their psychopharmacological action as uh, Panic was just talking about and for their action on catecholomies in general. And there seems to be some kind of additive effect that if you had two or three, two or more at risk alleles then the brain volumes differed. But this is very important that this difference di was not disease specific. Individuals, this was individual specific risk. It did not matter so much whether you had schizophrenia or not. It depended more on whether you had the allele itself. And these alleles are very high prevalence in the community. 40% of all, of all of us will have this so-called risk allele. So our brain structures will differ as depending on our genetic structure, which is, obvious, which is commonsensical. But the amount of this difference and how this would contribute to disease is something that we still don't know. This gets even more complicated when you look at actual behavioral or psychological tests, where you find that on, on detailed neuropsychological testing, siblings of patients who have bipolar disease show similar neuropsychological defic deficits as patients themselves, although they are not ill themselves. So the, the neuropsych deficits or brain function deficits are a different level of genetic uh, sharedness rather than just the affectedness. And therefore this un unaffected first degree relatives happen to have similar kinds of brain processing going on, although they are not mentally ill at, at, any, po at any point of time. And over the last few years, it, is, it has now become kind of a um, shared um, idea or a delusion, whichever way you look at it, that if you have the multiple, delu multiple uh, genetic loci contribute to various behavioral traits, and behavioral traits is in a very loose term because it can range from circadian abnormalities to early white matter diseases to def deficits in attention, so both structural, behavioral, and very complex core biological phenomena differ as a, as a spectrum. And these obviously start expressing themselves well before birth, and it's only in the presence of certain environmental events, of certain epigenetic influences, that a small proportion of those who carry the risk convert into an actual disease. 
So all the, the genes for risk to some neuropsychiatric disease may be widespread in the population, which accounts for their so-called common prevalence. Only a few of them actually convert into disease. But understanding the basic links between this level of variation, these levels of variation, and through these processes, what actually shifts somebody up here becomes very important. And over the last few years, what has ultimately occurred is this. So we were underpowered, and we are basically basi facing a black blank wall. And uh, this obviously is the great mystery of, of uh, contemporary science. So we thought with the help of NCBS and friends and colleagues at NCBS and NSTEM and various places, we would set this power issue right. So we would take our enriched cohorts, identify these private mutations, identify the rare variants, at least in the common diseases that we see, do very detailed phenotype assessment, which would include clinical, psychological, imaging, and life event uh, data. The biomaterial would be collected using blood, DNA, and the cells. These would be subjected to detailed genetic analysis, and ultimately to genome engineering and disease modeling, which would help us uh, answer some of these power issues that have proved so uh, difficult to address till now. As would be um, over the last 10 years, it's also become very obvious that uh, family-based linkage studies and association studies, which have been the so-called uh, the uh, bedrock of psychiatric studies, have their limitations because these are, as I mentioned, very often turn out to be private, and the frequency in population of these risk alleles is very high, and the total contribution is in fractions of a percentage. So of all the known GWAS findings that we have, they, they explain less than 5% of the variation in psychiatric disease. At the same time, we do have the occurrence of rare alleles which cause Mendelian disease, which, are very, which can be now identified with NGS. And but rare variants of very small effect are very difficult to define. But this is the range of events that comes to the clinic, and this is what we are interesting in, we're interested in. Of course, APOE4 is way up there, but we have not found anything like APOE4 in any of the other uh, so-called uh, chronic diseases like hypertension, diabetes, or um, schizophrenia. So what we've been able to do is collect all these kinds of samples. So we have several hundred patients with Alzheimer's disease who, have, who are now in their 60s. They have been ill for a, uh, uh, they've been ill for varying periods of time. And uh, they're fairly severely impaired with a mental state of 12. The normal is to be 30. And they are fairly severely ill at this rate. We have a large number of patients with schizophrenia, more than 1,000 uh, each of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and obsessive compulsive disorder, which is kind of a very severe anxiety related disorder. So all these patients have been collected over several years and they're all uh, you know, moderately ill and a large number of them co coalesce into families. We are also interested in the rare disease with the typical autosomal inheritance which, have, which are like Huntington disease and ataxia and I'll come to that in a little while. So see, these are then subjected to the NGS sequencing and what we get is obviously a large number of exon readouts. We, get, we can identify the splice sites, the mitochondrial data, and what we can use these to look at rare or coding alleles, and we can do a focused analysis of certain kinds of diseases that we can identify. Of course, all these things uh, happen automatically with DNA barcoding and all these things. So this we use to study not just the familial inheritance, but also identify unrelated individuals who have a similar phenotype and try to identify whether certain genes occur commonly in the general population itself independent of, of this set of data, and or we use extreme phenotypes, early age of onset dementia, late onset dementia, early, early onset schizophrenia or relatively late onset schizophrenia, good prognosis schizophrenia versus very poor op outcome schizophrenia. So the clinical uh, gaze allows you to differentiate phenotypes on various levels, and uh, the genetic contribution to each one of them seems to be slightly different. So this is the data which we, which we have um, which we looked at in 22 patients with very severe Alzheimer's disease and 73 population control who were, well, who were within the age at risk or who had passed the age at risk. They were all in their um, late 60s. So they, we divided these into very early onset dementia, the onset below 60 years, and late onset dementia, which is after 60 years, and the healthy controls. We got lots of data and uh, we got readouts for all of them. We then applied the common variance filter, the predicted delet deleteriousness filter, the genetic filter, and biological filter as being correlated with others on the clinical variation database or disease-specific databases. And at the end of it, even in this small data of 22 patients, we were able to define, to detect several variants that have already been reported in the literature as contributing to Alzheimer's disease. Some of them have been picked up from GWAS studies. Some of them have been picked up in other family studies. So a large number of candidate variants were identified even in a small set of 22 subjects. 
for example, one of them is a pre senilin mutation, which is part which is part of these, uh, which has already been identified. This particular SNP was different from the one which has been reported in literature. This person who carried the mutation uh, was uh, had been ill for at a, from a very young age, from the from the late 40s, and uh, from the mid 40s, and in um, whom we could detect this mutation. It is part of this intracellular loop, and because of the of the way we collect the data, his offspring is also carrying the same mutation, although they are uh, well under the age at risk. So now we have actually a kind of predictive marker. We don't know what to do with it, obviously, but the fact is that this person is basically having an autosomal dominant form of neurodegenerative disease, and this person is likely to develop it sooner or later, or very likely to develop it sooner or later. The other genes that, we, the other genes that we've been able to identify in the early onset group was the mitochondrial uh, uh, encoded cytochrome B, which is part of the electron chain transfer. It has been implicated in many aspects of energy utilization by the brain, and dementia is now ba basically being looked at as something like diabetes of the brain, where energy utilization by the brain is deficient, and which is why it gets uh, forgetful and loses uh, its activity. And these, uh, so in this group, we were able to find um, three, uh, uh, three individuals with these mutations. We, we were not able to find it in any, we have not been able to get the data from the Indian sample, uh, but its frequency in the 1000 genome thing is absolutely zero. So we don't know its actual mutation status. For the other two, which have, which have also been implicated, which is a GAP43 gene, which is a crucial component of an effective regenerative response of the nervous system. This, uh, this is a novel mutation not being detected in 73 controls or in the 1000 genome project. And so therefore, this is a novel mutation which has not hitherto been reported. Same thing goes for the CIB1, Gashwin integrin binding uh, canmyrin uh, uh, gene, which is uh, involved in cell survival and proliferation, and we'll come to proliferation issues in a little while. It has already been associated with cancer and Alzheimer's disease, but it's a different SNP, and this one again is novel in the sense that it's absent in these two databases. So now that we know that this gene is somehow linked to disease, what do we do with it? And that has been the, uh, the issue that uh, we've been working together with colleagues here and in STEM with Panix Lab, that we try to understand this at a, at a cellular level, and we try to model these individual specific cell material and try to see what happens. And over the years, there's been a lot of interest in using you know, uh, stem cells or uh, uh, lymphocyte-derived stem cells, and which have now become the, the tissue of choice because they do retain the DNA, they, we can get lots of material from, um, from the families. We can do the HLA typing and make sure it's all following absolute uh, correct patterns of relatedness. And we can reprogram them into various kinds of cells uh, fairly successfully by, by injecting them with, by treating them with EBV virus. We can transform them using established techniques and we can check for, the, for activity at various points of time, make sure there are no new errors being introduced in the karyotype and make sure that these cells remain stable. These remain stable enough so that between PBMC and LCLs, there is the sequencing coverage is slightly different, but the SNB coverage shows a fairly close concordance between these two, so they are a fairly stable source of genetic material. The fact that uh, the fact that the genotype has an effect or has a predictable effect on protein levels of the uh, amounts of um, of amyloid beta protein is also quite evident, so that patients who have three, four alleles, four being the risk allele for Alzheimer's, is different from those who carry the, the three, three allele. And again, remember that this, both these patients are clinically ill. The difference is only in the allele. Both these patients have Alzheimer's disease, and this is a control. This one has a three, three allele, and this is a three, four allele. So it's, so although these, it obviously is not explaining the entire story, but it does explain part of it. Mitochondrial mass does not differ, but mitochondrial potential does differ depending upon the uh, caseness. So again, we need to get this uh, understood a bit better. Oops, there's a hospital phone. So but over these years, what we've, uh, what we've uh, decided is that we'll extend from the DNA repository to the LCL repository, and we have all these samples now. And these patients who are the normals are well past the age of risk for both schizophrenia, OCD, and bipolar disorder, having lived um, to, let's say, my age. So that's good enough, I guess. <laughs> and then these are converted using plasmids, and we can grow various uh, neuronal lineages, and uh, we, can then, uh, we can then study whether E4 carriers and non-carrier cases or non-carrier control 
where the efficiency of this is reasonably at, uh, in keeping with worldwide standards of around 0.01%. And what Panic and all showed recently is that, uh, that, that this is quite successful. The EB virus itself is taken off over time, so that what you get is a, is a stable cell population, which is, which is correct for all the markers at various points of its differentiation. And this lovely blue fluorescence, which occurs as a part of reprogramming, uh, accumulates as, as it progresses and this can then be used to identify cells which have exited the, um, the differentiation state and that by itself increases the efficiency of subsequent populations much, uh, much easier. And of course the, between the LCL and the IPSC they, they do show a difference and, but they are completely synonymous with human uh, embryonic stem cell derived so that uh, lineages so that we know that we are reasonably on the right track. And eventually you are able to get a fairly predictable pattern when we starting from the you know, pluripotent stem cell culture to neural differentiation you get various kinds of morphologies which seem to suggest that we are in the uh, right playing field. The molecular characterization also clusters them into, into different lineages so that we know that LCL and, and uh, pluripotent stem cells and neurons follow a particular pattern and uh, the, the overlap between the embryonic stem cell derived uh, cells and the pluripotent stem cells is very high so that we are again quite sure that these are behaving in the predictable manner and the membrane responses show that they are active, they are viable cells. So at this point of time we, we have cells with different mutations. We know that they are cases and controls and can we convert them into isogenic cell lines and then differentiate them carrying disease associated with genetic variation, identify the cellular changes that are contingent upon the specific genetic change that we are interested in. This would help us identify differentially expressed genes and gene enriched pathways which would help us understand what these uh, processes are. And this would then help us identify interactors of these genes and build plausible complete disease pathways using whatever available literature and lots of postdocs and uh, students. So this is a, this is a kind of workflow. So we start with the LCL, we have the pluripotent stem lines, we have neural stem cells and then we have the full neurons and we, we follow this whole pr process by isolating the RNA, the fragment, the RNA and basically look for the transcriptome analysis. So this is what uh, one such data set showed that we have three individual samples. These three individuals are part of the specific genes that we have detected which we showed a few slides ago. And we did a complete transcriptome analysis. So all those three of them have very different kinds of mutations which have been, which are being implicated in dementia itself. There is an overlapping set of around 214 transcripts which is common towards uh, in all these three as compared to a control subject. These 214 subjects are different in the sense that there are a large number of uh, transcripts which are upregulated and some which are downregulated. And these pathways, conceptually at least, or, or uh, in a commonsensical kind of way, are actually fairly interesting for our, un for our current understanding of dementia. They include neuroactive ligand receptor interaction, as you heard, panic, focal addition, axonal guidance, inflammatory pathways and uh, glutamatergic synapses, we know that glutamatergic excess is, uh, is a strong uh, neurotoxic thing. And uh, the ones which are downregulated were again things which you can, at this moment in medical science at least, intrinsically link to risks of dementia. Again, DNA replication, co-occurrence co with, uh, with autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis, which again comes up a lot here. You have primary immune deficiency, type 1 diabetes mellitus, there's a gr big overlap of APOE4 and diabetes. So if you have diabetes and APOE4 allele, the chance of dementia increase almost fivefold. So all these things, in a way, start filling up the jigsaw puzzle in a somewhat better way than what we could otherwise do. And we, then we started looking at whether this difference is actually gene dependent. So if a person, or allele dependent, so if a person has a 3-4 allele versus a 3-3 allele, has one of the alleles that is contributing to risk, and we then interrogate particular pathways that we think are important in the cause of in uh, causing dementia, then we find that there are reliable differences between those who have uh, the risk allele, which is the uh, the four allele, so that there are some which are there are some which are underexpressed and some which are overexpressed. Now, this kind of noise cannot be resolved because the the patients actually come from very diverse genetic backgrounds, and to resolve that, we have been uh, trying to develop the isogenic cell lines so that the person with the E3 allele can then be 
consciously uh, converted into an E4 homozygote or E3, E4 heterozygote or E2, E4. E2 is vaguely considered to be kind of neuroprotective. And then f figure out whether just by keeping, by changing one particular allele and keeping the rest of the genetic background constant, how much of these transcriptomic differences are filtered through that filter. Because that would tell us something even more detailed about the nuances of disease causation. This is obviously a work in progress and we don't have the data of, on it right now, but this is where we have reached at this point in time. What we also, uh, if you remember in the beginning, I'd shown you some images about MRI images and neuropsychological changes, which we otherwise call endophenotypes. Now it turns out that the cells themselves can start having endophenotypes because cell cycle abnormalities, so patient derived cell material tends to reproduce much faster. And Alzheimer's disease has been viewed as something like an accelerated uh, dysregulation, accelerated aging process by which the cells uh, have abnormalities in their, in their cell cycle regulation. And in the few cases, and the very few cases that we have seen, there's obviously a, depend, uh, a detectable change in all of these cycling which are important for, uh, for the cell division cycle. So this is very brief in the last two minutes of what we are going to talk about. This is uh, the collaboration with NCBS in STEM and NIMHANS. Um, and this is a very nice painting by somebody called the Sync Twins which em encompasses everything that we need to know about psychiatry. These are twins who actually sign under one name. And all paintings are produced by these monozygotic twins who dress identical and produce similar paintings. So, and this is all the consultants from Nimhans who actually converge into groups. So we have an imaging core, we have a genetics core, we have an immunology core, we have biomarkers, cell models, and large number of intervention cores. So these teams of researchers will then interrogate things like dementia, neurodegenerative disease, addiction, schizophrenia, and various other disorders, OCD and, bi and uh, bipolar disorder. Our, our idea is that from Huntington disease or other rare Mendelian disorders like HD and ataxia, to polygenic disorders like dementias, to psychosis, the cognitive impairment, behavioral impairment, are, occur along a continuum. The brain pathology is also along a continuum so that you get you get detectable cell loss here, but you get synaptopathies and you get uh, synaptic fallback at this level. Protein aggregation seems to be a problem everywhere and molecular signatures definitely tend to overlap now with many genes and many pathways converging in, within uh, the same syndromes. So what we will try to do is to find out to what the initial disease triggers are on these, in these particular families and study what uh, these other endogenous responses or prolonged response of inflammation degeneration are and to find the various interactors and to see what, whether we can identify biomarkers, etc. The assumption again, like I mentioned, just give me one minute, that these are the core and these are the various disorders. We'll identify families with at least two people affected. And because of symptoms, similarity, comorbidity, and anatomical changes, genetic susceptibility, we will try to develop pathways to do this. And this is the most difficult aspect of it because these kinds of cohorts have been very slow and very difficult to establish. But this seems to be the only answer once you've finished with case control studies and familial studies, which is what has been done till now. So this is really the next generation of neuropsychiatric disease genetics, which, we, which is what we are trying to embark at this point in time. This is just an example of one of those families. All these family, all these people have been archived. Their cells are in culture. They all have bipolar disease plus thyroid disease plus cannabis-induced uh, cannabis induced manic syndrome, which is, um, which is a larger complex how addiction, psychotic symptoms, behavior, medical disease, and side effects co-segregate with each other. And each one of them is a separate issue. So this is the broad outline of the study. And uh, basically, we need to thank lots of people at, at NCBS for, for doing much of this work. And their names are all here. A lot of people at, at the Nimhans end, Manasa, Biju, Mira, uh, John, YC Jaredi, Matthew Verghese, all my clinical colleagues who help get all these families and follow them up over time. One of the pleasures, if you can call doctors ever having pleasures, is to actually see patients coming with their children and grandchildren. So if you realize in this family, we, we saw the grandfather and we are seeing the grandson. So we, we actually have data on the family across three generations in our hospital records. And there are many, many such families which, uh, which, which give us some hope that we should be able to do studies like this without any problem. Thank you very much for your attention.
So my question is a bit more elementary. So how do you really define a mental disorder? So as you already stated that there are um, uh, there are like kind of heterozygotes or risk uh, uh, risk alleles which in which the patients show milder symptoms. So I mean, how do you really segregate? Where do you draw a line? And so wouldn't it be more beneficial to if you actually just go about classifying peop uh, people according to symptoms rather than groups of symptoms? Oh well, you. Um we don't know the rules for making those symptoms. So I mean, that's a completely offline. Psychiatric interviewing and diagnosing and syndromes are, I think, well beyond the uh, boredom question of this audience. So we can talk that offline. <laughs> but it, it, is, it is a very relevant question. And these are things, because it's not just a single cross-section. It's also over time. So people may be perfectly normal at 15, but may have illness by 25. And they may recover by 35. And then they will have dementia at 60. So do you actually see all this as a single disease or as three different diseases? All these issues need to be understood. And that's where the cohorts are necessary. That's precisely the issue. Uh, hello. Yeah. So uh, uh, let's say so you just talked about uh, some risky alleles, so-called risky alleles in your lifetime. So what about, so, and uh, you also showed that there could be different kinds of genes. So let's say you find a patient where you have multiple of these kind of things, and then which, uh, how, how do you go about uh, treating them? I mean, which one to emphasize more? You, you, can't, you can't, there is no treatment available. Right. Okay. okay, as panic was very clear, we are living in the middle of the 20th century as far as drugs are concerned. Olanzapine, clozapine were invented in 1960. We, there's no new drug because we haven't identified any new pathway for risk of, for conversion of genotype to phenotype. The idea is that research like this would help us understand some of the pathways that contribute to the disease and hopefully open a window of opportunity for new drugs to be, to be conceptualized. Thank there are no new drugs based on genetic uh, changes. Thank you. Dr. Jain, maybe I have missed this point. You uh, again talked about the risk alleles and all the patients who have the risk alleles doesn't progress to the disease and there are other factors which are influencing. So in that case, I was wondering um, your strategy of taking the cells which have the risk allele and making the pluripotent cells and differentiating and identifying pathways, would that um, really uh, be something predictive of what you see for the factors which are additionally required to manifest the disease and how right. you overcome that? Right. So uh, these, these so-called risk factors can be reduced to two or three different uh, conceptual spaces. One, of course, is exogenous environmental events like infections, uh, like pe people with uh, influenza infections or certain kinds of infections have a higher risk of psychiatric disease. The other is the psychological space, which we cannot model in this system at all. But we can still model that if we go back to panic kind of work or animal kind of work or Shona's work, where we say that how stress translates itself into epigenetic regulation. So that's a, that's a model. The third is, of course, drug of abuse. Now you can model the same thing in the presence or absence of drugs that influence neurobiology in a particular way. So the effect of alcohol, cannabis, amphetamines on these systems can then be evaluated. So there are multiple opportunities to, to, to do this. So um, do the patients who have risk alleles know that they have risk alleles? How the, do you let me be clear. The risk allele is only a statistical concept by GWAS. The risk added on is below 1%. So it's not a risk in the real sense. For Mendelian risk, uh, you will convert it. It's not a penetrant. These are not penetrant but alleles. In terms of expectations, so you said, you said uh, somewhere during the talk that this person... That, that, that is the autosomal dominant variant. Right. So that will develop. Right. But each of these variants is not follow that kind of uh, logic. No, but in that case, does that person know that he is in danger of getting this? Or uh, not as yet. Okay. Not as yet because our consent or IRB approvals don't allow us, or they correctly should not be allowing us to uh, to deal with this kind of information. Okay. So, so for early onset dementia. So I, I was just wondering what role does you know diet play in across this whole spectrum of people because clearly. <laughs> You're, you're going to get individuals with vastly differing inputs, right. physical inputs. Right? So uh, right now we are trying to do a small study where we are looking at the effects of uh, early life malnutrition on eventual development of psychosis. Basically we are measuring trunk height versus 
whole height ratio as a marker of early, early life malnutrition. Because that has been a concern that children uh, born in the, both the Dutch and the Chinese famine seem to have a two-fold higher risk of schizophrenia. So that is a very important parameter, but there is no way of doing that in India because we know that 40% of Indians are malnourished. So we don't have a differential on that. So the only way to get a differential is to actually study it. So that's what we've just started a uh, few months ago. So, so Sanjeev, so early onset dementia, you had 72 patients. That uh, was no, 22 patients and 72 controls. 22 patients and 72 but controls. From the 22 patients, you already got a so many leads, number. Yeah. So how many such uh, patients have been sequenced the world over and are you saturated for the number of genes? Oh, no, 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 not at all. Like I said, in, these, in this small group itself, we've, dis we've found so many novels. So it's going to be, the issue is that individual SNP seem to differ, but genes and networks seem to be common. So the issue is to find the range of S variation within particular genes which coalesce into particular pathways which seem to be more at risk. And to then investigate these as pathway related diseases rather than individual SNP linked diseases. So we can follow up later. One last question. So have you compared your, I mean, the risk alleles to whole exome sequence database of, like from NIH? Yeah, that, that, that's what the, that was the window, no? It, goes, it comes, goes through the uh, NIH clinical variation database. That's how, that's how they've been but identified. It, but it seems like you, you, you said like there is a risk factor which is a 40% in the controls also. Sorry? And with, I mean, you should... No, the general, the risk alleles which are identified by the Wellcome Trust or the NIH consortia, many of those alleles have a population frequency of around 40%. I see, I see. So but I assume that all of us. In the slide, you showed that there is no risk factors in the controls, in the normals. See, the, uh, you're mixing up two different slides. The one, that one is for NGS for certain kinds of rare variants. The common variants which have been picked up by GWAS data is what is commonly present. So there are two different kinds of variations. The ones which are rare variants are highly penetrant and are very rare. And they are absent in controls. The ones which have been picked up by genome-wide association studies are widespread in the, in the community and explain a very small proportion of the risk. 1% to 2%. There are two different levels of risk. Okay. <laughs> okay.